This lecture is going to cover polymers. And this is one of your Unit 5 choices that you could make. Um, remember for Unit 5, you just need to choose two of the four options. So, so the four options are polymers, air, energy, and water. So if you're choosing polymers, then you just need to choose another option, um, whether it be air, water, or energy. Um, <clears throat> A lot of times students don't choose polymers very much because they're kind of intimidated by it. Um, but I always think polymers are quite fascinating because they are everywhere around us. Um, plastics are polymers. We are made up of polymers. Uh, we eat polymers. I mean, it just The list goes on and on and on. But for some reason, there's an intimidating quality that polymers have. And hopefully, after this lecture, you'll be a little bit more enlightened. You won't be so scared of them. You might think they're pretty cool. So a polymer is made up of monomers, which are repeated many times. So a polymer is made up of, I'm going to say, building blocks. And those building blocks are monomers. They are repeated several times. Several hundred times, several thousand times, several million times. It depends on the polymer you're talking about. Repeated several times. Polymers can be man-made or naturally occurring. So the natural polymers that we have interaction with every day, um, proteins. And you think, oh, what are proteins? Well, we eat proteins, right? Um, your hair is a protein. Your fingernails are a protein. All your skin, you're made up of all these different proteins, which are polymers. They have monomers that are repeated again and again. So with proteins, the building block is amino acids. Um, so the monomer is amino acids. Um, they can be used for many different purposes. Enzymes, muscle fibers, oxygen transport. The list goes on and on. Um, so examples, enzymes, muscle fiber, hair, fingernails, um, oxygen transport. So a very important polymer, proteins. Um, another natural polymer is DNA. So um, DNA carries our genetic code. Um, so and it carries the genetic code for all living organisms. So um, so this is a long chain, double helix, and it's made up of the monomer is the nucleotide. So, and there are four, four different types of nucleotides. So um, if you think about this, the genetic code for you versus me would be very different, um, but it's just these same four monomers arranged in different um, sequences that make us different, but yet similar because we're human. So <clears throat> it's just it's very fascinating. So this um, carries the genetic code for all living organisms. I always think it's fascinating um, in regard to DNA, you know, like if uh, you're interested in seeing what type of, uh, what breed of dog you have, you can send off a sample um, that, 
that contains DNA from your dog. Um, and they analyze it. They see how much the sequence lines up with maybe a German Shepherd or a Labrador Retriever or a Boxer. Um, so I had a friend who did that and they were surprised by the results. It didn't come back at all what they like they expected. So I always did joke with my husband like, oh yeah, maybe we should do that for our mutt dog. But we just kind of make up our own breed about her. She's She's just a crazy dog. But anyways, DNA is a polymer. Okay, starch. Starch is a long chain of glucose molecules. So glucose. Glucose is a sugar. Um, we all consume probably way too much starch on Thanksgiving. Um, potatoes contain a lot of starch. So you think about mashed potatoes. You think about um, corn. Corn has a lot of starch. Um, so they're connected in a head-to-tail fashion, um, and then they have branching. So the basic monomer of starch breaks down to glucose. So if you ever hear about diet, you know, there are all these different fads and diets, and it's saying, oh, well, you, you, need, you need to have something with a low glycemic index. Well, you don't want to eat a lot of mashed potatoes. You know, and it depends on the diet guru that you're listening to at the time, too, because nutrition changes so vastly. But an example of starch um, would be in potatoes, in corn, um, your rice, lots of different places where you can find starch. So these are examples of natural polymers. Now I'm going to talk about some man-made polymers, so these addition polymers. Um, and it's not that they're, they're all man-made. Um, the examples I give will, of course, be man-made and how we apply them. Um, but the thing with addition polymers is a double bond must be present in the monomer for them to be addition polymers. So the monomer must contain a carbon-carbon double bond. If you don't have that in your monomer, then you're not going to be able to make addition polymers. So um, what happens, these double bonds combine in a head-to-tail fashion. You keep seeing that over and over again, and it's just kind of arbitrarily assigned what's the head and what's the tail. With ethylene, both head and tail are the same. But what happens is this double bond opens up and connects to this double bond, which opens up and then connects to that double bond, which opens up and then connects to that double bond, and again and again and again, until you get this long chain. So this monomer is called ethylene. The polymer is called, are you ready for this? Polyethylene. Crazy, huh? And this is used for tough, rigid plastics. So for the exam, it's not that I care that you know exactly what monomer makes up these polymers, um, but the class of polymers. You should know that addition polymers, the monomer must contain carbon-carbon double bonds. So, uh, monomer must contain a carbon-carbon double bond. Uh, monomers um, join together to form long chain. Okay. So, here is another class of addition polymers. This is propylene. So right here we have propylene. Um, it has, it's an addition polymer. You know that because it has double bonds. So these all link together to form polypropylene. This is used um, in ropes and carpet fibers. So you can see the applications of these. Like I said, we have interactions with polymers every day. 
So if you don't think they're important, think again. All right, styrene. Styrene is another type of addition polymer. It's a little bit different looking. It has this, this is called an aromatic ring or benzene, but it still has these double bonds. So it's an addition polymer because it has the double bonds. They join together to form this long chain. So this is, these are styrene monomers, and this is polystyrene. Okay, um, so this is styrofoam, right? So this is used in coffee cups and packing material, like those packing peanuts. It seems like a lot of places are moving away from styrofoam because it doesn't, it's not very good for the environment. So you've seen a change, a shift. It used to be that whenever you get coffee, it would be the styrofoam cups. And, you know, you could take your, it's a soft polymer. You could take your finger and, you know, write your initial on your cup. Um, you could break it away and, um, you know, it could chip off really easily. Uh, and now when you go to different places, you get paper cups because they can be recycled a lot easier. Um, so one of the drawbacks, which we're going to discuss later, is problems with disposal of plastics, which is a big deal because we use a tremendous amount of plastics and we just throw them away. Crazy. We're, we're one of the first, uh, you know, kind of disrespectful in, in how we just like, oh, we can just put it in the landfill. We can just do this. So what's going to happen eventually? We'll just have all this waste. So, all right, um, vinyl chloride, this is a monomer, um, and again, it has a double bond, so this would be for addition polymers. Uh, so the double bonds link together to form this long chain, and the name is polyvinyl chloride. Uh, polyvinyl chloride is used in plumbing pipes, so this is... PVC, so used in plumbing. So we see this all the time, right? Um, all of our houses have PVC pipes, depending on how old your pipe house is, but yeah, most of them would have PVC pipes. Um, it's also used in plastic fibers, plastic bottles. Okay, um, tetrafluoroethene. This is tetrafluoroethene. Okay, and again, it's an addition polymer, and it forms Teflon. So this is the non-stick coating um, used in cooking. So non-stick coating. And uh, there can be... There have been a lot of negative side effects of this nonstick coating. It's pretty cool um, that it leaches into your foods. There have been some reports of that. Uh, it can chip off depending on, you have to use special utensils for it. Um, but nonetheless, this is Teflon, and it was a really big deal when Teflon was first discovered. Um, okay, now I put rubber in here. Because rubber would be an addition polymer because it has the double bond. Um, so it's an addition polymer. It's natural and man-made. Um, the one thing about rubber is that natural rubber is very soft. Um, so it has long, straight polymer chains, which makes it very soft. Um, which can be a problem because it breaks down over time. So, um, you know, this wouldn't be very good for our tires. You need a tougher tire. We would be going through 
tires all the time. So to harden this rubber, long polymer chains are cross-linked so that they are attached to each other. Um, the cross-linking is usually done by sulfur atoms. And this prevents the long polymer chains from moving too much. They still have some motion and are able to stretch somewhat, but snap back to the original configuration. So this process is known as vulcanization. So this is cross-linking of rubber with sulfur to create a more rigid rubber polymer. So this was a big deal. Goodyear worked on this for a long time um, and you know we have him to thank for our tires. Um, so vul vulcanization. Um, all right, another naturally occurring polymer uh, is celluloid. Um, so this is, uh, these are glucose molecules. And these glucose molecules would have OHs coming off um, here and here, but just for simplicity, I omitted those. Um, these are linked together by beta glycosidic bonds. Um, so there's kind of a funny story about um, celluloid. Uh, when plastics were, or polymers were first being developed, they were looking at the naturally occurring ones and then modifying them. So at one point, somebody put a nitro group, which is an NO2 group, which can be have a lot of energy. And that makes nitrocellulose, which is gun cotton. Um, then that was further worked on, and a tough transparent film was developed. Um, so Hyatt um, was the one who worked on this. He added camphor to the nitrocellulose, gave it a long-lasting moldable compound, and named it celluloid. So the thing with celluloid is that it's extremely flammable. Um, so this, this right here is cellulose. And um, celluloid is, sorry, modified cellulose. Okay, so the modified cellulose, modified cellulose called celluloid, is extremely flammable, um, and it was current. It was used for ping pong ball, balls at one point, and it was also used for billiard balls, and these would explode occasionally. So you can see why these are no, no longer in use. Celluloid is no longer in use. But these first polymers, plastics, were you know like everybody was doing their best and exploring these different different things. Um, so uh, there are a lot of polymers that have been um, made, other man-made polymers. Um, Bakelite, um, you might have heard of this. Like my grandmother gave me some Bakelite salt and pepper shakers, and it was a big deal because it was one of the first plastics. You know, if you think about it, um, early in the, like, 20s and 30s, this was a big deal to have plastic. Um, cellophane, that's a big one. Then transparent sheet of plastic, so saran wrap. Um, and plexiglass is a hard transparent substance, and this is used um, on airplanes. So it, less, it doesn't break the same way that glass does. So very useful, these polymers. All right, so we've been talking about addition polymers, and remember addition polymers must have the carbon-carbon double bond. Now we're going to talk about condensation polymers. And condensation polymers, um, they have, where did I have this? Oh, there you are. Um, two different monomers are reacted together 
and as part of the reaction, water is removed. So this happens with like your amino acids joining together. So the example I have here is two amino acids um, linking together to form a peptide bond, which you could imagine this, you know, this is just one segment of thousands and thousands of different amino acids linked together. This could be your protein. Now, um, what happens with condensation polymers? Water is lost. So you lose an H and an OH. So two different monomers join together and lose water. H2O. And sometimes I like to write, write it HOH. So what has happened is you've created a really long bond here. So this bond is your new bond. And another product of this reaction would be HOH. So one thing to point out is on each side of this, you have an OH and an NH2 where you could add more. So add more here and here. So you could do the same type of reaction. Okay, so you can just see how this goes on and on and on and on. Um, so other examples of condensation polymers um, would be polyesters, um, phenol resins, so bakelite, nylon, um, polycarbonates, and polyurethanes. So these are all condensation polymers. So, so far, addition polymers must have a double bond. Condensation polymers must lose water. So, must lose water. Okay. Um, all right. And that brings us to page three, or page four, the last part. Um, problems with plastics. Okay. So, the synthesis or creation of plastics, they are made from petroleum. So, uh, oil production and refinery is very expensive, and a lot of people argue that using petroleum to make plastics is a waste of this petroleum. You're just, you don't know how much longer, how many more resources we have for this crude oil, and then it's so expensive to refine. And there's so many politics involved with it. So this is a limited resource. Um, the other problem with plastics would be the disposal. They are very durable. So durable, do not break down easily. Um, and they are usually disposed of in landfills, put in landfills. If you try to burn them, when burned, some give off toxic fumes. If you've ever had the misfortune of smelling burning plastic, it does not smell good. Um, so it's definitely not something you want to do. Um, so one approach has been to create biodegradable plastics. Um, but the problem with biodegradable plastics is that they need to be exposed to sun and um, air in order to 
break down. So biodegradable need sun air. And this is difficult in a landfill. So these plastic bags that we use, um, I don't know how much longer they're going to be used. I know in California they're already banned with good reason. Um, they create tons of problems for nature. Um, they don't break down very easily. Um, you know, so when you interact with these plastic bags, think about this. Think how many plastic bags have I been handed in my lifetime? And, you know, a lot of you are quite young. It's probably quite a huge number of plastic bags. Um, so this is my um, soapbox. Get a reusable bag. Put it in your purse. Put it in your car. Not a big deal. It's so much nicer not to have these plastic bags overrun your cabinets. <laughs> it's crazy how they can do that. They just, like, it's like this nightmare jack-in-the-box of plastic bags. Um, but you think about those plastic bags, even though they're biodegradable, how many of them are going to be at the top of the landfill? How many of them are going to be able to biodegrade with sunlight and air? Because trash trucks are constantly dumping more on top, so it's not enough time for these plastics to, to biodegrade. So buy one, buy a reusable bag, and it could be made of recycled plastic so um, so that's that's one thing about plastics they can be recycled so soda bottles can be turned into carpet fibers or clothing items um, and one of the, the the deals with plastics is that the type of polymer that these plastics are made up of um, needs to be specified so if you look at the bottom of a plastic container you will see um, that there's a number, and this number corresponds to how it can be treated, and so then it's sorted. And you know, in the Kansas City metro area, we pretty we have a pretty sophisticated recycling program. In other areas, they're they are not so fortunate, and you have to do a lot of hand sorting, and it's a pain, and a lot of people don't want to do it. So we are fortunate that you know we. In our family, we have a trash bin and a recycle bin. Like that would, you know, it's crazy. Um, my hometown in Virginia, um, it's about a hundred thousand people. They don't even have that. So it's you have to take your plastics to a recycling center. So how many people are going to want to take their plastics to a recycling center? And here we are. We have a, you know, a recycling bin. How cool is that? So. Um, things to think about. So maybe think a little bit more about these plastics and polymers that are in your life, but they're all around you. Um, so a few take home messages just to kind of sum up this lecture. Polymers can be natural and man-made. Uh, they are made up of monomers. Monomers are the building blocks. So poly means many. So they're made up of many monomers. There are two types of addition, uh, reactions that we've learned about for polymers. We've learned about the addition reactions, which remember, you have to have the double bond. And then um, the condensation polymers, uh, a water molecule is lost. Most often, what we see is a water molecule being lost. So, um, okay, vulcanization. We talked about, remember the polymer we talked about vulcanization? That was rubber. So natural rubber tends to be very soft. Um, vulcanization creates a more rigid structure, so a more rigid polymer, um, and that's done with sulfur. So it's cross-linking of these chains instead of being long, straight polymer chains. Um, there are many, many downsides to disposal of plastics. We talked about them. They don't break down easily. Most of them are put in landfills. When burned, they give off toxic fumes. Um, some are now being made biodegradable, but that has even a downside because they need lots of sun and air, and it's difficult to achieve that in the landfill. Um, so, which brings us to recycling, which we just finished talking about. 
Um, and polymers are made from petroleum. So, or sorry, not polymers, plastics are made from petroleum, um, which is a limited resource. So that's something to think about. Um, you know, but they have plenty of advantages too. It's nice not to have to worry about your um, child dropping their glass bottle, you know. But now all these glass containers have silicone protectors and you can drop these glass things and they don't break. It's pretty cool. Um, but, and there, there have been a lot of studies too with, you know, if you're really curious about this, and I digress, um, a lot of chemicals from plastics leach into whatever you're consuming, whatever food it is. And if you think about how many foods are stored in plastic containers, when you go to the store and you buy cheese, what is it wrapped in? It's wrapped in plastic. When you go to the store and you buy um, chips, when you buy, I mean, anything in the store is, is plastic. Um, and so that does impact your food. Uh, drinking out of plastic bottles. Heating plastic and then drinking out of it. That's kind of a big no-no. Because um, plastics are polymers and they degrade with heat. Um, so I could go on and on and on. I, gr I grew up in a house where... All our food was microwaved and like reused plastic sheds spread uh, country crock <laughs> um, containers. So they're microwaved and I mean, I can remember melting plastic in the microwave one time. Um, so I've always been very ardent believer in using glass Pyrex to store, you know, leftovers in one of my fellow chemistry <laughs> undergraduate um, friends, she feels the same way. So I think it's uh, sometimes the more you know about these things, the more cautious you are. And, you know, your friends might be like, why are you using a reusable bag at Target? They have plenty of plastic bags. You're nuts. Or why are you drinking out of a glass container? Why can't you just drink out of a plastic container? But anyways, um, I hope you enjoyed this lecture about polymers and you learned something and you think about how you use polymers every day. Let me know if you have any questions and remember you need to pick one more option for unit five. So um, energy, water, and air. And I'll have those up shortly. All right. Um, until next time.